This video builds upon the previous one which covered factorial ANOVA. So like that topic, nested ANOVA is a method for comparing a single variable between groups, but in this case those groups have subgroups nested within them. So what are nested factors? Well, it's a, it's a sampling structure that's hierarchical. So there's higher level or broader groups, and they have smaller subgroups nested within them. So here's an example on, this, on the slide here, um, where the higher level group is, say, landscape type, whether it's farmland or forest, and the nested subgroups are the individual lakes, one through eight, and lake 1 has a bunch of measurements in it, and lake 2 has a bunch of measurements, and, and so forth. So importantly, the fact what makes this nested is that the items, the lakes, occur in only one of the broader group levels. So lakes 1 through 4 occur in farmland, lakes 5 through 8 occur only in forest. You don't have one lake in, in both types. So this differs from the, the crossed design, which was in the previous video on factorial ANOVA. In cross designs, all levels of one of the factor occur within all levels of the other factor. So, for example, there, there are soil samples in both low and high phosphate. Wood chip samples occur in both phosphate levels. And low phosphate samples occur in both soil and wood chips, and, and so forth. But why bother with this, this structure? Why go to the trouble of dealing with this this extra level of complexity. Why can't we just ignore these subgroupings and just do a regular ANOVA, a one-way ANOVA, or even a, a t-test? Just, you know, group up all the data from farmland lakes and all the data from forest lakes and, and, and run it then. Well, to understand why this is not really a good thing to do, think back to the assumptions of ANOVA, or really the assumptions of any statistical test. So because there's structure in the data, because of this nested structure, it's quite probable that some lakes just have inherently higher or lower clarity values than other lakes do. So as a result, the fact that we have multiple measurements from one lake, there's this nested structure, means that many of these individual measurements are not independent of one another. And that violates the assumptions. Almost all statistical tests require that the data points are independent of one another. So this is something called pseudo-replication. Because the measurements are independent, that means that the degrees of freedom, which are basically the sample size, um, are too high. They're incorrectly too high. And that makes the test appear more statistically significant than it really should be. So we're increasing our chance of getting a false positive signal. So the exact goals of nested ANOVA depend on the sampling structure, what groups there are, how they're nested, the goals also depend on the scientific questions you're trying to ask. But, you know, given all that, most often we want to test for significant differences among our higher level group, but often don't really care about the subgroups nested within them. Now, that's, not, of course, not always the case, but you know, here's a very simple example where there's two levels of main groups. We have the farmland and the forest. In this example, we might care if clarity water clarity differs significantly between farmland and forest regions, which are the two levels. Um, but we might not care about the differences among all the lakes in those regions. We may not care if lake 1 and 2, 3, 4 differ from each other. So in this situation, the null hypothesis for the higher level groups is that they both have the same mean value. So that's a pretty typical null hypothesis for ANOVA. So I also said that, you know, perhaps we don't really care about the subgroups themselves. But what does that actually mean in a, in a more formal sense? So this nested structure introduces the idea of fixed, fixed effects versus random effects. The distinction between these two types of effects is somewhat fluid, somewhat diffuse. Um, it may depend on the questions you're asking. So in some situations, something might be a fixed effect, but with a different type of question, that same thing might be a random effect. So what, what are these fixed and random effects? Well, in the example in this video, region type, which is farmland versus forest, is being treated as a fixed effect. Generally speaking, to identify something as a fixed effect, you can look for, for example, the levels in that effect represent the entire population. So that could be one thing to look for and or the goal that you have is to test for differences between those levels. 
So in the example we have here uh, in this video, uh, there probably are more types of land use than just farmland and forest. So that doesn't really meet the first one. Farmland and forest probably aren't the entirety of land use types in the population. But we're treating it as a fixed effect regardless because our goal is to test for differences between farmland and forest. So you have to, sort of, you have to treat it as a fixed effect. Also, sort of generally speaking, to identify random effects, you want to have things where the levels within it are random samples from a much larger population and or you're not really interested in the differences between those levels. They might be kind of nuisance noise in, in, your, in your data. Well, in our example in this video, both of those cases are perhaps met. I mean, it's a hypothetical example. Unless there's exactly four lakes in each region, we have a sample of lakes from a bigger group of, of lakes. Um, but more importantly, in this case, perhaps we don't care about the differences between the lakes, so we're going to treat it as a random effect. So if the nested subgroups are being treated as a random effect, the null hypothesis for them is that the different subgroup levels don't add overall variance to the model. But really the statistical results for random effects typically aren't even reported um, or, or investigated in this type of study. Now, in contrast, if these nested subgroups are fixed effects, say we actually do care about the differences among the lakes, we have some reason for you know, wanting to know if lake one and two differ from each other and differ from lake three and so forth, we could treat them as fixed effects. And the null hypothesis then would be the same as for the main group, that the, the means of each level in our category is equal. So what is the requirements for nested ANOVA? What are the assumptions that this test is, is using that we have to make sure that our data meet? Well, first you're gonna need one continuous dependent variable also called the outcome or the response. Your question really is, does this variable differ significantly among the groups? So this is what you have in all ANOVAs. You also need two or more independent variables, but in this case, they have to be nested. Uh, this is the main distinction between factorial ANOVA, where in factorial ANOVA, the groups are, are fully crossed, so they, all levels occur in all levels. Here, they the levels of our subgroups don't occur in all levels of our main groups. Uh, the individual observations or measurements that you're making must be independent of one another. Um, this is partly what the nested structure is dealing with, the fact that there is a structure that makes them not independent unless you deal with random effects, for example. But the other thing to look for is to make sure that there aren't repeated measurements on the same object or the same the same thing. Um, this is one common way of non-independence that you have to deal with otherwise. So the dependent variable must be more or less normally distributed um, for each combination of the groups in the independent variable. And there's also the homogeneity of variances assumption uh, in which the variance of the dependent variable should be similar for each combination of groups in the independent variable. And these are all assumptions and requirements that are, that are typical of, of all ANOVAs, really. And finally, it's important to have a balanced design. And this means that there's the same number of subgroups nested within each main group. They're not the same actual items, but there should be the same number of groups within each main group. And there should be an equal sample size in each subgroup. So if the design is unbalanced, if you don't meet these assumptions, there are methods that try to deal with that. Uh, they're a bit beyond the scope of this video. You may want to consider other approaches instead of ANOVA even, such as something called mixed effects modeling, which I'll, I'll mention briefly at the end. So what does nested ANOVA do? Well, it starts with the general ANOVA approach that is partitioning variants or sum of squares into different components. We have the between groups, the between subgroups, and the within groups components. Now, after that, we will calculate F statistics, like is done in regular ANOVA, one-way ANOVA, also in factorial ANOVA. But here, the calculation depends on the structure, whether it's fixed effects or random effects. So, if the subgroups are fixed effects, the F statistic for the main group is the between groups mean square divided by the within groups mean square, and the F statistic for the subgroup is the between subgroup mean square also divided by the within groups mean square.
But if you're looking at random effects for your subgroups, we don't really consider the subgroups F statistic, but the F statistic for the main groups is the between group mean square, in this case divided by the between subgroup mean square. So finally, what pieces of information are important when reporting the results of a nested ANOVA? Well, first, it's important to describe the structure of the model used. What were the random effects? What were the fixed effects? Um, you know, go, go through the, the sort of the model structure. You should report the sample means for any fixed effect main groups that you might have. This is really what we care about. We care about the difference between means among all the groups. This is, you know, how big of an effect it was there. You should also report the various statistical parameters, the F statistic, it's two degrees of freedom, you know, there's degree of freedom one, degree of freedom two for the between groups and the between subgroups mean squares, um, and then the p-value for the fixed effects as well. And this is the information that can help you decide, you know, how likely is it, is there an effect? Can we tell whether the means differ in one way or another or not much at all? The statistical results typically aren't reported for random effects. You know, often, at least in R, you don't get F statistics or p-values for them. We're often not really interested in looking at them. We're treating the random effects as kind of to, to deal with this non-independence. So to wrap up, nested ANOVA could be a good approach, especially if you have sort of simple structured models with maybe, you know, one level of nesting and some random effects. But when the combination of fixed and random effects gets more complicated, or when the assumptions aren't met, and it also you know, becomes harder to meet the assumptions the more complicated the model structure gets, there are other methods that are perhaps better. In particular, there's something called mixed effects models, uh, which I'll cover in a future video. And, and these can be more flexible for more complicated sampling structures, more powerful when the sampling structure is more complicated. You could deal with a lot more fixed and random effects structures. Um, and potentially more robust to assumptions. So, you know, nested ANOVA is, I think, largely or starting to become uh, superseded by mixed effects models, but it can still be useful in, in sort of simple situations where you have very, you know, sort of straightforward nesting and good assumptions being met.